Hello, listeners. I'm Tim Sardamas, and it's Monday. Joining me, as always, is my talented and beautiful co-hostess, Voice. Good morning, Tim Sardamas, and welcome all our listeners to Middle Earth. Tim Sardamas. Voice? I have a joke for you. Hopefully it's Lord of the Rings-ish. It's not, actually. It's your favorite. Vegetables. You set me up. <laughs> <laughs> what do you call an angry carrot? Hmm. That they're going to karate you? <laughs> You know, that's that's actually pretty clever, but it's actually a steamed veggie, just like you are. <laughs> <laughs> Carrot Adamas. <laughs> I refuse that. <laughs> For new listeners, Voice and I enjoy reading and talking about stories from the internet that are interesting, funny, and dramatic. Because of our love of stories, we've come together and created this channel to share with you those experiences. And hopefully give you some food for that. So, Voice. So, Tim Stradamus. What have you brewed for me this morning? This morning, I brewed for you a taste of spring, chamomile, hibiscus, pea flower, rose hips, cinnamon, dried raspberry, blackberry, and elderberry fruit. Ooh. You know, I put the pea flower in there hoping that it would come out with a really vibrant color. It it looks not vibrant at all. <laughs> it tastes fantastic. That's a five out of five. Yes. A little early for spring. It's cold as hell outside. <laughs> it is. But I keep thinking as the wind keeps blowing over here that maybe we'll find the first signs of spring where the beautiful flowers begin to bloom and then it gets colder. Yeah. Keep it winter. Keep it cloudy. I love this weather. I love the clouds. I don't like the cold. Well, while you go ahead and enjoy your morning brew, why don't we go ahead and delve into these stories? For any listeners wanting to follow along... All story links are in the description below. For our first story, am I the a-hole for expecting my date to cover the cleaning cost of a dress he ruined? I, 27 female, am in a bit of a dilemma and could really use some advice. I've been seeing this guy for a couple months, and we decided to go to a nice high-end restaurant for a date. Initially, I was going to wear a nice dark blue dress that I like to wear out but he asked me to wear a different white dress that I had shown him once as it matched his outfit. I've never had a guy ask me this. The white dress in question was a gift from my late grandmother and was quite expensive. So I was reluctant, but agreed, and just asked that we didn't go anywhere after where I might spill something on it or otherwise mess it up. He mentioned clubbing after dinner, which is why I said that. I didn't want to risk messing the dress up. And he said we could just go to dinner and I could change out of it before doing anything else. Great. However, the evening took a turn for the worst when he accidentally spilled his red wine all over my dress. He had gotten an unexpected call and when he tried to quickly mute his ringer, his elbow hit his glass and it spilled all in the lap area of the dress before I could react. It was completely drenched and stained. He was apologetic at the time and I tried to be cool about it, but inside I was devastated, especially since I had mentioned specifically how I wanted to be careful wearing it. Later, I mentioned to him that the dress was very expensive and asked if he'd be willing to help with the cost of cleaning or replacing it. To get it professionally cleaned and the stain removed would cost $100, which I asked him to pay half of. To my surprise, he got quite defensive. He argued that it was an accident and that I was being unreasonable for expecting him to pay for something like that, and that it was my fault for wearing it out knowing that it could have happened. I feel like it's a matter of principle. Yes, it was an accident, but the dress is ruined, and it was extremely sentimental to me not to mention a valuable dress. He thinks I'm being materialistic and making a big deal out of nothing. Now, I'm not sure how to feel about his reaction. Am I the a-hole for expecting him to cover the cost? What a fun way to get us kicked off into Monday. A dating disaster? Yes, and a really good way to filter people out of your life is the way I hope she saw this. Because in this story, you have what sounds like a very lovely OP. She's wearing a dress to a dinner that she was requested to wear by her boyfriend to match his outfit. Now, during the dinner, unfortunately, the lemony snicket stuff happened. What can go wrong will go wrong. 
and he spills wine and not like a little drop. This sounds like a full cup into her lap, I guess. She says that she tries to handle it the best she can, and he's profusely sorry for what he did in the moment. And I guess that gets torn away the second they leave, because now she's asking him to help pay for it, rightly so. By the way, he owes her the full amount, the full hundred dollars, not the 50. It was his fault. Yes, accidents happen, but that doesn't clear you of accountability and responsibility towards the situation. You don't just get a pass because I had an accident. Where is that fast pass card? I want it. (laughs) I've made plenty of mistakes, but I've made sure to fix where I can fix them. So in my mind, OP, 100%, you are not the a-hole. Your boyfriend, though, is very questionable only because if you're willing to kind of shirk that responsibility, what else are you not willing as a partner to be held accountable for? So the consensus on Reddit is that our OP is definitely not the a-hole. In fact, many individuals say that one, he was the one to insist that she wear this dress. And two, he was the reason why the spill happened. Just those two factors alone makes him responsible for the costs. And the fact that our OP isn't asking for the full amount, only half of it is more than fair. Many people say that she should be asking for the full amount. Now, Let me go ahead and delve into a bit of the nefarious here. There were some Redditors that came out saying that they wonder if this was a test by the OP's boyfriend, that it's very weird that he specifically asked her for this white dress, that he specifically ordered red wine, that it was in such a way where he spilled an entire glass on her lap because he was muting the ringer on his phone. Detective voice, what are you doing? Well, on top of that, when our OP does decide to go ahead and recoup the cost to go ahead and get this cleaned, rather than supporting, as you said, having some accountability and responsibility, he turns around and calls her materialistic and essentially tells her that she should have known better. Maybe. Just maybe this was a test to see how far he could push the OP before she snapped back. Or would OP be willing to bend and be walked over? I hope it's not. I hope he's just a dense goon and it just played out like that. But I hope so too. Although there are some Redditors that came out saying, whether it's men or women, that they've had instances where they were being tested to see how far somebody could really push them. Sure. And I really do hope this isn't the case. I I hope that he was just some greedy a-hole and that she could just dump him to the side. I honestly, I think both are bad options, but I think one is really less of a bad option when you're talking about someone's character. Because one, you're talking about somebody being selfish. The other one, you're talking about someone being manipulative. And that's really scary, especially when it comes to the dating world. For me, I have to say, if this guy is really complaining about $100 and it being too expensive, why are you going to high-end restaurants and clubbing? That's a true ask. I can get behind that. I think I'll come back to the fact that you understand that it meant so much to your girlfriend. You would make sure to get it taken care of because it was your fault it happened. It comes back to what you had said earlier. You were right. It's values. And that should tell you enough about the person you're dating. Well, let's go ahead and move away from newly dated couples. And let's go into more of an established relationship for our next story. Am I the a-hole for opening a fake gift during a family Christmas party? Every year, my family does Christmas at my mom's. And she insists that we open all presents together, even gifts between spouses, etc., It's normally an okay tradition, but sometimes it can spark jealousy or comparisons between families. This year, my husband saved up and bought me my dream designer handbag for Christmas. I know some people aren't into that, but it's something that I truly love. We're not well off, but we're not doing poorly either. But I knew that the handbag would cause a lot of discussion amongst my siblings and parents. I just didn't want their opinions and criticisms to ruin a special gift my husband worked hard to get for me. So this year, 
My husband got me an extra gift that wasn't the real gift. It was a moderately priced skin care set. Christmas came and went without drama, but I recently posted a picture of my husband and our kids at dinner, and my handbag could be seen hanging off the back of my chair. One of my friends commented underneath about how gorgeous my Christmas gift was as well. Long story short, word got back to my family and they totally blew up. Some were annoyed that I opened a private gift separately from the family. Others were criticizing the price of the gift. My siblings are now calling me disingenuous for harboring a secret gift, and they said that I did it because I think I'm better than them. I didn't open it with them because I didn't want their opinions, but now I'm starting to feel like an a-hole for keeping it a secret. I knew either way they'd all criticize me though since it was so much more expensive than all the other gifts, so I don't know whether or not I'm wrong. Am I the a-hole? Is this a real story? This is a real story. Is this how some families treat each other? I've never heard of... I understand gift exchanges in families. You know, on Christmas, that kind of stuff. Everyone gathers. Everyone gets to open each other's gifts. I have never heard of a family setting up rules for individuals saying that you cannot open private gifts that are between you and your husband or your wife. Let me go ahead and actually read to you a Reddit commenter and their experience when it comes to these kind of family gatherings and gifts exchange. Is this is a thing? So a commenter called Ornery said, you're totally right on this. My dad routinely gave my mom what she had asked for, which, sorry, yes, my mother was strange. Always kitchen equipment, household appliances, or power tools. I sometimes joke that they got married so they could do home improvement, cooking, and sewing together. But her sisters and cousins, if they knew those things were the real gift, would have been full of pity and condescension. So my dad also got her a nice piece of jewelry, not super expensive, but nice, that she could show everyone as her Christmas gift. I think my parents were unusual in the jewelry being the public gift, but I honestly think most couples exchange special gifts privately and don't feel obligated to parade them to other family. It's OP's family, not OP and her partner, who are behaving badly. Oh, 100%. There's no boundaries. And I agree with the poster. A lot of couples share intimate gifts with each other without anyone else seeing it. And if that's how you so choose to do it, you're allowed to. And if you want to go the other route where this family clearly is like, we get to see and judge everyone's gifts to each other. Could you imagine that type of expectation in a gift giving scenario? I can't, honestly. What kind of undue pressure are you putting on everyone? I think that that would probably be a interesting conversation to have with the rest of the family. And then if it wasn't respected after that, we're not doing Christmas anymore. And that leaves a gross taste in my mouth. So OP, no, you are not the a-hole. I hope that you got perspective from everyone though. Well, the consensus on Reddit is that our OP is definitely not the a-hole. In fact, there were many Redditors that came out and said, you should tell your family how nasty this tradition really is and that you no longer want to participate in it. I definitely understand people's want for privacy, especially when couples do exchange more expensive gifts with each other. The last thing that you want to do is make other family members feel like their gifts no longer have value, which is why I totally understand having a set of private gifts for you and and your significant other, and then turning around and there'll be some gifts that you can open up with family. But to go so far as to judge, unfortunately, I've been a part of those situations. While I've been the flower on the wall, it's been real awkward. You know, if that was us, obviously we would never have even gotten into that point. But I feel like on the way out, I would probably request that you give me coal <laughs> in front of you. I got you the most expensive coal today, Tim Hummus. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Just see everyone judge us. That'd be awesome. Well, let's go ahead and go to our next story and see about this next relationship. Am I the a-hole for telling my wife I feel unwanted and undesirable? Me, 34 male, and my wife, 33 female, have been married for three years now, but together for 10 years before that. 
We have a two-year-old as well, but whilst that might be an additional factor, it is not the cause. I found over the past five or so years that she doesn't ever initiate sex at all. It is either something I initiate in the spur of the moment or something planned going to a hotel for an event. I told her that the fact she didn't ever initiate things was hurtful for me as it made me feel undesired and unwanted. I explained how it felt like she was just always waiting for me to initiate. She's always super flirty around the house makes jokes and winks at me, but it's always times when I'm working or she's taking care of our kid, so I know it's playful, but she doesn't intend to go anywhere and I'm not missing signals. I've asked her if there's any reason for it or if I can do something or am already doing something that might be the cause for it and she doesn't say anything. Am I the a-hole for thinking I shouldn't always initiate? Definitely not, especially when they're having a child and they're going through, they're in their 30s now? Correct. Libidos start getting out of whack, depending on stress, work, all of the factors that go into just being a human. <laughs> Those things can kind of make it seem and feel like sometimes you are two ships just passing in the night. And he says he's tried to talk with her already about it. Correct. And she has nothing to say? It sounds like, based on his comments in the comment section, she just sort of shuts down when it comes to conflict. Okay. Well, see, that's why I say definitely go get into some type of counseling and learn how to communicate. Because it sounds like maybe that's where we need to start with this relationship first. You've been together for, like, they said 10 plus years now. Correct. They have a kid together. You owe that to each other. Because I'm sure you can find happiness on the other side once you get those tools. Now, I will say this, though. There was one thing in there that I um, kind of scraped over. And it was that she does get flirtatious and give you the winks and do those things. And yes, they might be when you're working or doing things, but those are signals. Those are signs. And I don't know whether or not, because I think he says, well, she knows they're not going anywhere because they're in the middle of us doing things. But that's normally how you initiate. You start, you, you give a touch, you... A I, look. You know, it just takes a little bit. You take off a sock the wrong way. You know what I mean? <laughs> I would just say ROP is definitely not the a-hole for having the feelings he does. Making sure that you are both giving and receiving what you need as far as intimacy is concerned is important. Just as important as other aspects in your relationship. So get it to a healthy place. So the consensus on Reddit was that our OP is definitely not the a-hole. In fact, the OP actually said in the comments section that they had gained a bit of weight over the expanse of their relationship. And many Redditors came forward saying that this could possibly be a reason why she doesn't initiate intimacy. When someone doesn't believe that they are physically appealing to themselves, it can also impact intimacy with the partner. I guess I didn't come at it from the confidence level because that does come off on people. Now, others believe that she probably just feels better when he initiates. And while the OP did add a lot of context into their bedroom details, quite a bit in my opinion, some believe that maybe she isn't into the kinks and prefers to be more vanilla, and maybe they're just kind of missing each other on that front. Now, regardless, the unanimous message was that there needs to be some work regarding their communication, and they need to go to therapy if it's not working out with just him communicating his part. Now, listeners can definitely go ahead and go into the comment section and see what the OP said. I've kept this one as straight off into the subject as I possibly can, because when people start delving into personal details, things that I feel should just be between a couple, I prefer not to have the judgment be based on my own biases on what should happen in the bedroom. Well, let's go to our next story and see how this sibling relationship is going. Am I the a-hole for evicting my sister after I helped her out by renting my flat to her for years? My sister has made some poor decisions in life and as a result has poor finances. She has two kids with someone who was clearly a deadbeat and made excuses for him and is now stuck being a single mom. Three years ago, she couldn't pay her mortgage and her flat got repossessed. I am a property investor 
and I quit my job to pursue real estate full-time and was able to buy it. By that time, my sister got another job, and I agreed to rent it to her. I have only increased her rent by around 20% every year since. Recently, a wealthy individual from Dubai approached me and asked me if I could let the flat to him as the location is ideal for some work he has to do in London for the next two years. He was willing to pay a little higher than market rate for it, 15% more than what my sister currently pays. I sent my sister a no-fault eviction, which asks her to leave in two months so I can rent it to the other guy. She can overstay this two months and get evicted by bailiffs, but she eventually chose to go. I had to do this, and there have been rumors about the government banning such evictions, so I did it as soon as I could, which means she left before Christmas. She found another place further away. I don't know what her rent is, but my mom told me she doesn't like it and has damp issues. When I called my sister to invite her for the usual Christmas party at my place, she got very angry and refused to come and called me an a-hole and scum as though the years I helped her out meant nothing. I allowed her to stay in the same place she was familiar with for three years, and I never said it was forever. Even though I don't have a traditional job, keeping track of the needs of my tenants and properties is a lot of work. I have 12 flats to deal with and my own home. Edit. Since it isn't clear, I did her a favor as I charged her under market value rent initially and did slightly higher than market increases every year until it caught up to market value this year. So for three years, she had it cheaper than market value. Am I the a-hole? So before we like get started, I want to clarify something. When landlords charge market value, they're also getting a profit off of that property. Initially, maybe ROP was doing her sister a courtesy by giving her undervalue rent, but increasing it 20% year over year, that's not really doing a favor. My experience says that rent only really goes up 3 to 5% each year, not 20%. Now, I do understand, though, over the last couple of years, people have been taking advantage of that and increasing rental prices sky high. But we're talking about a family member. That's where this kind of circles back for me is you're kind of bragging that you did her a favor, that she's renting this property under value for the first year, maybe. But then you caught it back up within three. I think that's what I understood from the story. Correct. How big of a favor did you do for her? Because at the end of the day, this guy from Dubai asked to rent the flat and he goes, I'm going to give you 15% above market value. Now, instead of going to her sister, even though this is still wrong, she should have definitely gone to her sister first and said, I'm being offered 15% more for this flat right now. Can you match it? Because if you can, I'm keeping you. She didn't even do that. She didn't have the common courtesy just to do that for her sister. Even though again, it's family, you charging your family member more to live at your rental essentially trying to get a profit from a family member is really scummy especially when you already told us that you have 11 other properties you're making income on you, you couldn't have just this one property be at market value and be happy with that because remember market value still means that our op is getting a profit yes but apparently she needs to get above that and at the cost of is this her sister Correct. Oh, man. This is an immediate family member. This is a sister you have that you've, it almost sounds like lorded yourself over because you're saying it, how much I've helped her. That's an issue. What's interesting to me is, and I'm not sure if this is in America, they said mom, I think, in one of the things. So maybe they're in the UK. I believe they are in the UK. No, I don't know how rental uh, agreements work, but in America, normally you sign a lease agreement. And that doesn't sound like one was in place because you were able to sit there, tell your sister you got two months to leave or I'm going to evict you. Um, if there had been an agreement there that protected your sister from people like you, then especially when you're talking about rental increases, because I can't believe that 20% is legal anywhere. So to provide you some insight on that, in the Reddit section, at least in the comments, there was an individual that said that they are from London and they don't have limits. 
Okay. I guess I'll sum it up like this. OP, you're an a-hole. You had a family member that was taking your help, but it's almost as if they owe you now. That's a problematic headspace to be in. So the consensus on Reddit is that our OP is definitely the a-hole. Mind you, a lot of them pointed out exactly what you pointed out, Tim Stradamus, that when you're talking about meeting market rates, generally those rates consist of the landlord having a form of profit over their tenants. Now, while our OP did give her sister below market rates for a very short amount of time, Essentially, in the three years, they hiked up her sister's rent by 60%, which is absolutely crazy in my mind to think about. On top of that, many Redditors pointed out, you did so many a-hole things. You evicted your sister before Christmas and then didn't actually help her find suitable accommodation. Now she's dealing with mold problems because you wanted to make a quick buck. There were a lot of commenters, especially people from Canada that say they hate the town that they live in, but they love their landlord. Their landlord has been very accommodating. And the only times that they've ever had their rent raised is to try and keep up with certain expenses, certain fixes. Uh, And a lot of the times it has to do with taxes. But most good landlords aren't looking to make the biggest dollar out there. You're talking about our OP who has 12 properties and they're probably getting a hell of a pretty penny on this economy right now. But there still needs to be understanding that that was your sister. And I do get though, it's your property and you're allowed to make the money that it's worth, but maybe having a little tact and understanding and perspective goes a little bit longer than making sure your bank account is as full as it can possibly be. I think the one thing that really upsets me is that our OP does essentially admit that she put out her sister and her sister's two kids and then also says that she never had a loss to begin with concerning the home that she rented to her sister. That really strikes me as wrong. She's meeting market values and market rates. That means that she was getting a profit off of her sister and that was no help to her sister at all. There's no way for her sister to actually save to try and get another home of her own and correct all the wrong that apparently happened and that she's trying to work through. She implies that she really doesn't have any guilt on doing any of this because she's got no real close connections to her sister's kids. Regardless of whether or not you have a connection, you should still understand that what you did was morally a little wrong. I think maybe she's only looking at it from the fact that she could make more money. And for her, those values are make more money. And of course, she's not going to see that she was wrong in any way. Well, those family relations are a little skewed. Why don't we go into our next story and see what you think about this family? Am I the a-hole for telling my wife that I would choose my mom over the birth of our baby? So this is a throwaway account. I will check some of these comments, but not all. So to get started... I am 36 male, and my wife is 33 female. We are expecting our first child soon. My mother, who is 70, was diagnosed with stage 4 cancer and has been hospitalized since it is so bad doctors say she will not survive since treatments aren't working well on her. My dad died when I was young, and my mom took care of me while working two jobs so that I could have a good life. I feel I owe everything to my mother. I bought her a house and whatever she needed so that she could live her older years well since we had to struggle so much. When I got home from work and visiting my mom, my wife and I were talking and she asked if you got a call that I was in labor or your mom was going to die, who would you pick? I told her I would pick my mom. She asked why, and I told her that I wanted to be there to say goodbye to my mom since I would never see her again, and so she would have somebody there in her final moments. She got mad and said, what about her and our baby? I told her I would try to be there as fast as I could after my mom, but that most likely wouldn't happen, so I told her not to worry about it. She was still mad and told me to get out of the house. I left 
And now I'm at my mom's house. So Reddit, am I the a-hole? Edit, to everyone saying that I would be leaving her alone, no, I wouldn't. She would have her mom there. She has said she wanted her mom there with her. Yes, I was right for leaving my house. It was either I leave or she go, and I was not about to put my pregnant wife out of our house. Yes, I have been there for her. I have taken off work to comfort and help her in any way she needs during this pregnancy. Edit 2. I keep getting the same question about why did I leave my house even though I may own the house. It was late, and I didn't want my pregnant wife out late at night, but she told me to leave so I knew it was either me or her. 2. My mother is in the hospital. She is not at her house. 3. I thought a lot about what a lot of you said about how I should put her first, but she doesn't put me first at all. She chooses her sisters over me all the time. Fourth, I do not make her feel second. I have put my wife first, especially in emergencies, and I have tried my best to comfort her. I have gone home, and now I'm thinking I don't need to apologize to y'all. I really don't know. Thanks to everyone who's commented. Am I the a -hole? Okay, so this story is frustrating because ROP goes out of his way to explain that he loves his wife and he does what he can to make sure that she's loved. That's all I heard from here. The thing that bothers me the most is his wife asking him a question. And yes, she is pregnant. Let's frame that correctly. She's asking him a hypothetical question that if it was between picking, seeing his mother pass and being there at the end for her, because he does put it in good detail. He loves his mom. She went through a lot to make sure that he had a good life. Not many people get those type of parents. So you can already understand the bond he has with his mother. And having to pick between that and her going into labor. Now I understand you want your partner there in the most ideal situations. But if he had to choose in this crazy hypothetical that she put on to him, because that's where this issue is. This is a hypothetical that may or may not ever happen. But as his wife, you know that that woman, his mother, means a lot to him. You only get one chance to say goodbye. Once it's gone, it's gone. And I've heard so many examples of the regret that people have had not being able to be there for their loved ones at the end. Now I get it. She is pregnant. She's going through all the hormonal changes, the ups and the downs. I'm not downplaying that and I'm not trying to shame it. But to be in that moment when you know your husband's going through what he's going through with his mother, that she's at stage four and any day could be the last one. He does the right thing in that moment because he does say it. I'm not, I'm not throwing my pregnant wife out of the house. But in the perfect scenario, yes, you'd love to be there for the pregnancy. But you put him in a, such a rough spot. Good for him for telling you the truth. So OP, no, you are not the a-hole. I hope, because the thing is, I'm frustrated at all the questions that he's had to maneuver through. Because a lot of those seem outrageous. And through a spectrum of, you haven't been there yet. Because if you have lost someone, you wouldn't be talking to someone that's on the door of that in that way. And maybe I'm getting too much in my feels, but <laughs> you're not the a-hole OP. Well, the consensus on Reddit is that our OP is a mix between not the a-hole and no a-holes here. Now, Redditors have come out and a lot of them empathize with the rock and a hard spot situation. Some opted to say, try and come up with a compromise that might comfort her mentally because it seems like that's what she's looking for. Others said that they can see it from both perspectives. Some from the complicated birth that could be very scary and people have had to deal with. Others from the farewell perspective of a loved one. I think I like this comment from one Redditor. They said, don't borrow trouble and force a choice before anything is known for certain. I will say, I don't think our OP is the a-hole at all. I have dealt with a complicated birth when it came to our son. And I know how scary that is. I've also lost my father. And I know how that feels. The one thing that I can tell you is you don't get that chance to say goodbye ever again. And while there may be the chance of a complicated birth, you don't ever hope and wish for it. You have to believe that everything's going to be fine so that mentally your body knows it needs to be strong in those moments. 
Tim Stradamus, you and I know someone very close to us who never got to say goodbye to their father. And we've seen how much regret and torn up that they are on it to a different level. I think it is so important that we be allowed those moments if they do come to us. And I have to go back to don't borrow trouble. It's just not needed. It was a terrible question to have asked him, especially when he's going through it. The mere fact that she knows how much his mother means to him in his life. She put him in the corner when she knew he was already in the situation. And there are a lot of commenters that came out saying, I would never let my husband have that sort of choice. I would always support him going and being with that family member that he loves. And to piggyback off that, let's say for sake of argument, the relationship didn't mean that much. They had a hard relationship growing up and he really wasn't that close to her. Then you know what? In that moment, fine. Then pick your wife having the pregnancy. But that should have only been left up to OP, not OP's wife guilting him and making him feel ashamed for how he feels about a relationship in his life. Well, things got a little bit steamy on that one, didn't it? (laughs) Let's go on to our next story and see if I can steam you up a little bit more here. No. (laughs) Am I the a-hole for forcing my husband to sleep outside in the cold? I'm in complete shock at the moment. My hands are shaking even writing this. I'm on a burner due to the nature of this post. I don't want anyone close to me knowing yet as it's still fresh. I found out my husband of 11 years has been living a double life and has been doing something so disgusting, I can't even fathom how this was getting past me in my own household. I feel so ashamed and so embarrassed. My husband is a truck driver, and more times than not, he'll be out trucking for months at a time. He doesn't have to be, but he reassures me, telling me that it'll help to make us more money. I thought nothing of it until recently. I feel so stupid because I didn't put two and two together, that he's been making the same amount of money since he first started trucking. He wasn't out months at a time back then. He hasn't made more money. So where's the extra time went to? Well, I found out from a friend of his who revealed to me that he's not only been cheating on me with several hookers, but he's been running around and having an affair with his friend's daughter. He's been letting her stay in his truck. I have no clue how old she is because the guy was steaming over the phone. I didn't even get the chance to ask about her age. He came home last night and I couldn't even look at him. I was disgusted. I made him pack his stuff and told him to leave. He's been calling and texting nonstop saying he's out in the freezing cold in his truck and he doesn't want to get a hotel because of her. All morning, he's been banging at the door, and a part of me feels bad because of the weather. I just don't know if I want to let him in. The other part of me just wants to leave him to the wolves and the elements. He keeps saying he wants to be at home because he works hard, he's cold, and he wants to explain. I just feel like there is nothing to explain, though. I don't know what to do. I'm freaking out right now. I feel so betrayed. My life is falling apart before my eyes. Words cannot describe the pain I feel. And I know what he did is so wrong. But am I wrong to not let him stay here until I figure out what I'm going to do about him? I'm just worried because we both have ownership of the house. So I don't know if I'm even allowed to keep him out. Am I wrong to make him stay outside? Any advice is so appreciated. So we'll tackle this story because there's a lot in here that's alarming, but there is one specific thing that is troubling for me anyway. And it has nothing to do with the fact that he's sleeping with, in her words, uh, a bunch of other hookers. It's the fact that there's a relationship with what it sounds like is someone underaged to the point where the father had to call, I guess, ROP and blow them up about how her husband A grown adult is doing something with someone who is underage. That is an issue, full stop. He's lucky that you haven't already called the police and started an investigation on him. I think that should be your next course of action. Um, It's not even trying to be petty or get back at him. It's to protect people. 
So OP, no, you are not the a-hole. So the consensus on Reddit is that our OP is definitely not the a-hole. In fact, many individuals did start giving advice. Their first advice, take all the money from your bank. Do it before he decides to wipe it out and puts you in a hard place where you can't manage bills or pay for the necessities in the house. Additionally, go get a checkup with the doctor. See if you have any STDs. Your health is by far extremely important. Next, confirm the age of the girl. And if she is underaged, report it to the police. He's absolutely disgusting. And last, lawyer up. Yep. I think all of it's really good advice for a very devastating situation. The one thing that I will say, and if OP should ever run across this very tiny channel, <laughs> do not feel ashamed and embarrassed for the actions of someone else. You only trusted someone that you loved and who gave you no reason not to trust them. Now that your trust is broken, just don't be the fool to trust that same person again easily. Yeah, I can't imagine thinking that your life is one way and having it completely flipped over and shown to you for what it truly is. Uh, I can't imagine your reality being shattered, especially in that manner. Well, let's go to our very next story and I look forward to your insight on this. Am I the a-hole for leaving Christmas dinner early because my sister-in-law wanted to name her daughter the same name as mine, but spelt different? I am a 30 female and my husband is a 32 male. Mary Chrysler. <laughs> we have one daughter, Madeline, eight female. I have a sister-in-law, Jasmine, 32 female, and she has been having infertility issues for a while now and has had a couple of miscarriages. Jasmine and I aren't that close, but we're friendly to each other. She got pregnant a few months ago, and she had her gender reveal party about two weeks ago. Everyone was so excited and happy when we found out that she was having a girl. During this year's family Christmas dinner, she announced that she was going to name her kid Madeline, but spelt differently, of course, as if that made it any better. Her daughter's name was going to be Madeline. I was completely shocked. Never in my wildest dreams did I expect that Jasmine would want to name her kid Madeline as well. If she told me before we named our daughter, I probably would have taken that into consideration before naming her. I asked Jasmine why she would want to name her daughter the same name as mine, and she said that technically it wasn't the same name since it was going to be spelt different. She also said that her great aunt's name was also Madeline and that she thought that Madeline was a cute name. Jasmine also mentioned that Madeline was supposed to be the name of her kid before she had a miscarriage. This was before Madeline was born. I never even knew that was what she wanted to name her kid because she never told anyone. I was really upset and told her she could have just told me before I named my daughter that she also wanted to name her daughter Madeline. She said that I was always such a witch and that I probably would have named my daughter Madeline either way. I don't even know what I ever did to this woman. I then asked what we are going to do about the confusion of them having the same name and she told me we could use my daughter's middle name. Like what? I told her if anything, we should be calling her daughter by her middle name since my daughter came first. We went back and forth a few more times before I decided to leave early with my husband and Madeline. My daughter was also pretty confused and asked why her aunt would want to name her daughter the same name as her. I'm still really upset and hopes she changes her mind, but this morning my brother-in-law texted me and said that I should try to better understand Jasmine and her feelings. I texted him back and told him that she should stop being such a witch and try to understand my feelings instead. I really don't think I'm an a-hole, but am I the a-hole? Oh, oh, you are an a-hole. <laughs> Imagine being so self-involved that you believe you own a name and that other people have to come to you to get permission to use a name. Now, don't get me wrong when we're talking about, because I know we had a story a long time ago where we were dealing with 
a family and a religious or a cultural important name, maybe there's some argument had there because I can see it from that perspective. But when you're talking about a name and what is it again? Madeline? Madeline. But it's spelled in a way where it says Madeline. So essentially Madeline from our OP's daughter is M-A-D-E-L-Y-N and her sister-in-law is putting M-A-D-I-L-Y-N. Okay. Still an interesting spelling. I think it's a pretty name. I don't mind Madeline. I honestly get tickled with the type of control that feels like ROP is trying to exert onto her sister-in-law over a mere name. I understand maybe there is a little bit of weirdness because ROP's daughter is named Madeline. Correct. So you have two Madelines in the family. Is that really an issue? I was at one family gathering that had a bunch of Katie's. It happens. That's Katie one. That's Katie two. That's Kate. (laughs) And then Kat. Yeah, you know, (laughs) you get cool nicknames out of it. But I do feel bad for your sister-in-law. She shouldn't feel bad over a name she wants to give her child. And she also says she's doing it because it gives honor to someone in her life, uh, a grandparent or something like that. A great aunt. I guess irregardless of the reasonings as to why you name your kid what you do, it's not up to other people to give you the okie doke as an adult, whether or not you can name them that. That's ridiculous to me. So, OP, you are the a-hole. Well, the consensus on Reddit was really mixed between you're the a-hole and not the a-hole. Now, the post itself by moderators was put as not the a-hole. However, let me go ahead and provide both perspectives. I need it. <laughs> <laughs> the you're the a-hole comes along line with how you're describing it Timstradamus. they say that the name is not exclusively to anyone and should therefore not be treated as that the not the a-hole one says yeah they think it's a little weird the whole situation in general and the only reason why it stemmed into the op being not the a-hole is because the sister-in-law insisted that her daughter use a different name. But, okay, let me ask this real quick. The only reason why she even insisted it was because the OP had started this weird thing about not having Madeline as the name of her daughter. She didn't go up to OP and demand, hey, by the way, I'm naming my daughter Madeline, so you need to start calling her by her middle name. She didn't say that. They just said she was trying to find a compromise and went back and forth with each other in anger and then went on to like, well, then you could call her her middle name, right? Unless I miss hearing the story, but... You're not. There are other individuals who say that they believe that this is probably a power move from her sister-in-law. Her sister-in-law said she named... She wants to name her child Madeline because of a great aunt. How is that a power move? And why would anyone do that with their children? Honestly, people have done pretty weird things when it comes to their kids in order in order to make a power move. I'm just saying, I've actually heard of a woman who said that she named her kid a certain name because it upset a family member. So we're saying that this power move is to upset the OP? I'm saying, at least for me, I'm not saying anything. <laughs> <laughs> For Redditors, they're stemming it from their experiences, from one being the uh, quote unquote victim of these kind of power moves, because there are other people who have said that, yeah, they've had the same situation happen to them. It's just something that you're going to have to live with. That is so interesting. I've never been a part of that and I've never seen that situation, but I guess if people are saying that that's their experiences. And here's where I think it comes down to. I've been a part of my father's side of the family who really looks high on the names Robert and James. And therefore, it's sort of even Edward, although Edward was more of a middle name. But all of those three names, like within the last four or five generations, have had some form of James or Edward or Robert in there. In fact, my cousin and my cousin's uncle and my cousin's great great uncle, they all have renditions of Robert as their name. And we therefore named them variations of the name Robert. I think for me, I'm not bothered by this. If anything, if I would have had my cousin Jennifer actually be named Voice, 
I would find it a little weird. I would too. That's really weird for naming a child horse. <laughs> <laughs> However, I wouldn't find any issue with it. I would just probably have some really cool nickname that I'd want to be called as. Overall, I'd have to say I don't agree with our OP being that upset unless you know for sure, a hundred percent that the reason why your sister-in-law is using that name is just to get at sure. you. Sure. If there's something written down on like a stone tablet somewhere. You caught a text, you're like on that, you screenshotted it. Like yeah. it's such a far stretch. The only reason why you're upset is because now to you is no unique factor in it. Do I think your feelings are unfounded? No. I think you're allowed to feel what you feel. I don't think that it's right for you to take your negative feelings. And if you know that your sister-in-law's had trouble having children, and this is her wish, I would just leave it as is. Find a cool little nickname. Use Maddie, either for her daughter or for you whenever they're with each other. Yeah. I am official name arbiter of our family. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Her name shall be Matty Lice. Well, we had... A family encounter that, ooh, at least with the in-laws didn't go so hot. But let's go back to more immediate family problems. For our next story, am I the a-hole for saying I should have let my mom kill herself since she's defending my sister, not me? I'm using a throwaway since this is the kind of shit you don't want anywhere near your main. I, 26 female, have recently found out my boyfriend, Robbie, 28 male of four years has been cheating on me with my younger sister, Allie, 25 female for the past six months. He accidentally sent a text meant for Allie to me. It didn't have her name, but it sounded so strange with how we usually talk to each other. I grew suspicious and made the decision to go through his phone during the middle of the night while he was asleep. There, I found months of texts exchanged between them, flirting, sexting, planning dates, and making fun of me. I was furious, too pissed to go to sleep, and ended up confronting Robbie the moment he was coherent enough to understand what I was saying. Robbie admitted to cheating on me with Allie, not that I needed him to, and that it wasn't his fault, and he didn't mean a word of what he said about me in the texts. They apparently hooked up during the time back in June because I was recovering from heart valve surgery and couldn't handle not having his dick wet constantly. So Allie offered to fuck him after he complained about it to her. I told him to shut the fuck up, dragged out a suitcase from the closet and told him to put whatever he can fit into it. I told him that I'll pack up the rest and ship it to wherever he was staying. Robbie just nodded, started packing and then called his mom so he could stay at her place. I calmed down enough by the time he left to go stay at his mom's place, laid down for a nap, and confronted Allie over text once I ate. I told her that I didn't care what her excuses were. She was a shitty sister who fucked my boyfriend at the first opportunity she got, and that she'd never see me again if I could help it. Once Allie saw it, she sent me a barrage of texts similar to Robbie's bullshit earlier, confirming what he said about how the cheating started and just making herself look worse. I blocked her. I eventually explained what happened to my dad, my mom, and my other sister, Talia, 27 female. My dad and Talia were horrified to hear what Allie had did to me and said they would talk with her. My mom, however, confessed to admitting to knowing the affair was happening and letting it happen without telling me because Robbie treated your sister so well and that Allie was in love with him and deserved to be after what happened with her ex. To be clear, Allie's ex was her college boyfriend and the relationship she f***ed up herself by trying to push him into an open relationship because she found one of their classmates hot. I was so shocked by this that I didn't end up even speaking to my mom for a couple of days until she called me and begged for me to forgive Allie and made more excuses for my sister's behavior. This happened after I just sent the rest of Robbie's stuff to his mom, so it infuriated me even more than it typically would. Out of pure rage, I told my mom that I shouldn't have stopped her from 
killing herself two years ago, since she's so invested in defending my sister when I was the one who got betrayed. There was just silence on the other end for a few seconds, and then my mom hung up. My mom tried to kill herself two years ago through cutting her wrists, when she and my dad were majorly considering divorcing, with my dad flat out living in a different city than her. I had walked in on her right when she was about to do it and managed to get the knife out of her hands. My mom then spent some time in a mental health facility and attending therapy, which I ended up paying half for until she gained more financial stability. I stayed days at a time to comfort her and making sure she didn't hurt herself when she was feeling depressed. Now, my dad and sister have told me that even though what my mom did was horrible, I shouldn't have said that of all things to her. It felt good to say it in the moment, but now I feel so shitty about it. I just want someone else's opinion on this. Am I the a-hole? Before we truly delve into this story, let me go ahead and give you a comment from our OP regarding her parents' potentially broken marriage. They said, Their near divorce was caused by my mom's reckless spending and gambling, which she had dipped into their retirement fund for. That was my dad's final straw that made him temporarily move out until he reconciled with my mom. This is a very multi-layered cake you found. Delicious. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. So let's see if we understand everything. They just described the mother's relationship and all of this and what she had contributed to the almost divorce she had with her husband. So you can kind of see where she's at mentally, especially when it comes to not taking accountability for the things you do. And who is the daughter that cheats? Allie. If your parents aren't willing to hold you accountable for the things you do in life, you get the situation that we're in right now, that the youngest daughter thought it was okay to cheat with her sister's boyfriend while she was recovering from heart open heart surgery or something heart valve surgery oh my goodness and then on top of it in the text our op saw that they they were making fun of her that baffles my mind how gross of a human being are you now we can get back to the question she asks is she the a-hole for saying what she did to her mother i can understand when emotions get the better of you in the moment and you'll say whatever you think is going to hurt someone the most now i don't partake in those things you can't take back words. And in this situation, especially when you're talking about what had gone on within the family, I don't blame her for what she said. Would I advise against it? Of course I would. Given that we all are human and we all make mistakes, DOP is not the a-hole. What your mom did and how she explained things to you and tried to justify your younger sister doing what she did was disgusting and wrong. So the consensus on Reddit was that our OP is not the a-hole. So let me go ahead and break this down into two things. The first thing is commenters pointed out that your mom says that she thought it was a great idea that essentially your younger sister and your boyfriend cheat while you go through heart surgery. And that while you did such a serious procedure, during one point in time, you took care of your mom so much so that you even paid for treatment. You don't owe your mom anything. The first things first, don't feel bad about something that's happened. Don't go out of your way to say the hurtful things that would make you feel guilt and bad later on, because then you're giving more almost like power to those people. And many Redditors came out saying, cut contact, stop engaging with your mom and your sister. They are not worth it. Your mental health is not worth it. And now comes the other part of Reddit that I thought was very interesting and that I'd bring forward. Some Redditors came forward and said, your mom did something that was pretty bad in her own relationship. She took retirement money to go ahead and feed her spending and gambling habits. So much so that her own marriage almost collapsed. She threatened to do something that was extreme so extreme that you had to essentially dote on her and many wonder if maybe that was all just an act 
Now, I'm not saying that there isn't any seriousness or severity to all of it. I think this is a messy situation. And I get it from that viewpoint because the thing is, your mom did something that was really bad and essentially reconciled with her husband. And now she's trying to okay her youngest daughter that did something pretty heinous as well. There seems to be this trend, at least when it comes to your own mother's values, that is very skewed. And you can see it written in this one situation. It does make me wonder if she was willing to keep quiet about this, what other steps that she would have done to kind of correct her own mistakes. Sure. Now, I know this is delving. And as I said, this is just a segment of Redditor's that I'd like to bring forward simply because it was conversation that was talked about. I have to come back to the base of all of this. You said something that made you feel bad. Don't engage with those people anymore. Don't let them live rent free in your mind. Agreed. Well, I know we've been dealing with all these family relationships. I just can't seem to stay away from it. So for our next story... Am I the a-hole for telling my daughter she has to accept my marriage? I, 42 female, am getting married this year. I've known my fiancé for three years, and he proposed to me this New Year's Eve. I have a 14-year-old daughter and a 12-year-old son. He has a 13-year-old daughter. Our kids have known each other since the beginning of our relationship, but my daughter just can't stand his daughter. On the other hand, my son likes him and has never had any issues with his daughter. I can't understand the reason, but everything his daughter does is criticized by my daughter. I've talked to my daughter about it, and all she can say is that the other girl is annoying, childish, and she has even called her names. I really can't grasp the problem. I find my future stepdaughter sweet and bright. I've never had any issues with her. My daughter also doesn't like my fiancé. She says I could find a much better man. I've talked to my daughter, and she simply says she thinks he's dumb and arrogant. After my fiancé proposed and I accepted, I told my kids, and my daughter didn't like it. I expected this reaction. When she met my fiancé, she was extremely rude. I reacted and sent her to her room, where I told her to stay quiet and that her opinion doesn't matter to me. I'm getting married, and she has to accept it, just like she has to accept sharing a room with her new sister. She had a crying fit and hasn't spoken to me for days. I told my sister and my mother, and they say I'm wrong. I can't see how I'm wrong. I'm an adult, a mother, and I decide whom I marry, not a teenager who knows nothing about life. Am I the a-hole? Edit. I told her she had to accept it, and her opinion didn't matter because for the past three years, I've been trying to understand her reasons for being against my relationship, and she has never stated those reasons. So now I'm getting married. And for those who said I didn't make an effort to build a relationship between my stepdaughter and my daughter, my son travels alone many weekends with my fiancé, while my stepdaughter comes to stay with us at home. Even so, my daughter barely interacts and says it's disgusting for the two of them to travel together for hunting. Am I the a-hole? So I like the quote she has when she goes, I'm the adult. I'm an adult, a mother, and I decide whom I marry, not a teenager who knows nothing about life. That right there. Yeah, I think you still need to do a lot a bit more learning about life because it sounds like you've alienated your daughter from your life completely. It's always been my way or no way. And you said something to the extent of, well, I've been trying. And for three years, she hasn't told me the singular reason. You know what 10 through 13 year olds don't do well? You know what most adults don't do well? Communicate and tell you exactly what they want. It really does take a lot of work in order to get to the place where you as a person figure out what it is you want and need. But it sounds like you don't understand that, especially with kids. I'm not sure what it is the extent of the problem with her and her stepfather or future stepfather, but you haven't helped it. And I'm also not sure her problem with her future stepsister. But again, you have not helped. You say that 
they're in the same house, I guess, during some weekends when the f- future stepdad and the brother go out hunting. But then there's no interaction between the sisters. That has to do with you, too. You have to facilitate these things. You have to put things in action as a parent. But to simply, it sounds like just drop them in the water and hope that they swim together. That's not how it works. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes kids just get on. And it's great. You don't have to work very hard at it. Stepbrother. <laughs> but in this case, my way or no way isn't a good way to go about blending a family. Because it sounds like it's a very bitter and zero respect from either side of the aisle here relationship that she has with her daughter. I would suggest maybe getting into some form of family counseling and figuring out what is exactly going on. Because if you expect that she's just going to give it to you on a platter and explain to you what's been going on, you're going to keep getting the results that you have been. OP, you are the a-hole. Life isn't about telling people they to just deal. So our consensus on Reddit is that our OP is definitely the a-hole. In fact, it really boils down to the one comment about her daughter's opinion not mattering. Redditors have suggested she needs family therapy just like you have. And they have also said forcing them to share a room will only make things worse. Now, let me go ahead and play a little devil's advocate here. Since I've been a part of many blendings between both my parents, my father, his second wife, is also my stepmother. Because my father married my stepmother during his second marriage and they got divorced and he married her again in his fourth marriage. My mother is the third marriage. Let me just put that out there. It's very confusing, but I only bring this up because one of the conversations I've had with him is who he felt was the person that he loved, loved deeply in his whole life. And he very much admitted to me that it was my stepmother, his second wife. So I asked him, why is it that he's not with her? Why did he marry my mom? Why has it come to this? At that time, no matter how much my father said that he tried to work on his relationships with his stepkids, they always saw him as the villain. Simply because as children, they only saw that their mother was no longer with their father. And therefore, my father was the problem. If my dad was out of the picture, their mom would go back to their father. And it put a major rift between the relationship. And so they got divorced because my stepmom felt like she had to choose between her children and my dad. I think for me, when my father told me that he respected her decision to divorce him, that he understood her values and he still loved her, even to that day, it really brought a different sense to a child's perspective, and how adults have to really show their children through communication how important it is that some relationships are. I think our OP, all that I see from her side is that she's frustrated. And her frustration for me shows. You hear the eyes and the me's because she's thinking from a place of, I've tried to understand my daughter and I don't. The only thing that I understand is just me. And therefore, that's all I can write down. I think family therapy in this situation is definitely needed. I can't, I guess you could say, fault the frustration of our OP. Do I think she was callous in what she said? Oh, hands down. Do I think that she's making a situation worse? Oh, definitely. Can I fault her for being human and having those frustrated feelings? No. I hope she does take to the comments and really take family therapy seriously. But I really do wish them the best. She definitely needs to communicate better. Now, I will say a lot of Redditors actually came out and said, hey, look, is there anything that you think your fiance is doing that is making your daughter uncomfortable at all? Our OP says she has never left her daughter and her fiance alone in a room. It's never been anything like that because that was our OP's initial reaction was, is he doing something to my daughter? Sure. And she is point blank asked her daughter and said, has he done anything to you at all? And her daughter has said, no, nothing's happened. So at least in that front, the safety of a child was first and foremost. That's the one thing that I definitely appreciate from the OP. Well, we see it from a daughter and a mother. Let's potentially see it from a father and a daughter, shall we? For our next story, 
Am I the a-hole for telling my husband to apologize for invading our daughter's privacy after he saw something he didn't like on her phone and took it away? I, 36 female, have a daughter, Stacy, 17 female, and two days, my husband, Josh, 38 male, had borrowed her phone to send a text to my mother-in-law since his phone had died. From what he told me, after Josh had texted his mother, he had opened Chrome on Stacy's phone and saw a website called Archive of Our Own on one of the tabs. There was a story about a character sexually assaulting another character from one of Stacy's favorite shows in graphic detail. It disgusted my husband so much that he stormed into Stacy's bedroom, confronting her with it and began yelling at her for reading it. Stacy cried because he called her disgusting during it. And then Josh took the phone back to our bedroom where he stayed in for most of the day. When I came home from work, Josh told me what happened and demanded we punish our daughter by taking her phone away from her for the next two weeks and send her to therapy. I said no to all of it and asked Josh why he was snooping through Stacy's phone in the first place. He couldn't come up with an answer. I told him there's much worse things Stacy could be doing than just reading about something so dark that he invaded our daughter's privacy and hurt Stacy's feelings by calling her disgusting. I took her phone out of our bedroom and gave it back to Stacy. I then told Josh that he should apologize for invading Stacy's privacy and calling her disgusting. Josh has since then apologized for calling our daughter disgusting, but hasn't apologized for snooping and refuses to do so. He says I'm being an ass for expecting him to. Am I the a-hole? To provide some more details from our OP in the comment section, the story that Stacy was reading about was a prequel to the Game of Thrones House of the Dragon. As you know, those stories are very graphic. Sure. Additionally, her father is her bio dad. She does pay her own phone bill as well. Hold the phone. A Lannister always pays their debts. <laughs> <laughs> the 17-year-old pays her own phone? Correct. You have no right to touch her phone. I'm assuming that she's paying the phone because she has a job. Correct. On top of that, the only reason why we even know that is because a Redditor actually tried to come out and said... He pays the bill. He decides what to do. And our OP lashed back and says, by that logic, I'm the one that pays the bill because he's unemployed and I would be the one that would still decide in this matter. And then she said, additionally, Stacy actually pays for her own bill. Woo. We're just undressing everyone. All right. Well, she let her father because this is not a stepdad. This is her father. That's her actual bio dad. What you doing, man? She let you borrow her phone in good faith. That's where it should have stopped and ended. And if you had seen something on accident, because I don't know why he opened Chrome, does he explain why he just accidentally tapped on the button or was he snooping? Apparently, he doesn't provide clarification to our OP. He's just snooping. She gave you it in good faith and you broke that trust. Good luck having your daughter trust you from this point on. It's an invasion of privacy. And to call her disgusting and berate her in her room about... A book? This is about a book. Yes, it's essentially it's a fanfic about Game of Thrones, the prequel, which is the House of the Dragon. I'm always shocked when people don't treat their kids, regardless of the age, like they're humans and that they're items to be told what to do with. You dehumanize them and you teach them that boundaries don't exist between people. You don't really win. It's There's no winning. What happened was your wife came home we find out that you're unemployed, that you're breaking boundaries with your 17-year-old daughter, that she had to come into your guys' room, scold you as if you're a child, tell you to apologize for your actions, and that she gave back the phone to her daughter. You got completely embarrassed in front of your family because of, I'm not sure what, you don't tell me exactly what the motive was in all of this because this is my thing you're unemployed you're at home all day your phone dies did it really die because the thing is a phone dies that happens but you plug it in and you wait the whole two seconds for the to come back on and then you couldn't have made the i guess it was a phone call to someone yes 
Was it ever really a phone call or was he just simply there to snoop on his daughter? If you had a problem with whatever your daughter was looking at or a suspicion of something, you just have a conversation. They're not a completely different species. I'm befuddled by this. Oh, I hear it. <laughs> so, yeah. OP, you're not the a-hole. Your husband needs to learn some boundaries. So, let me start with the consensus. Our consensus on Reddit is that our OP is definitely not the a-hole. I must say, I'm tickled that our OP's husband would try and get into anybody's business that's not his own. Their daughter is almost an adult now. If she wants to read stories from archive of her own that tend to be a little graphic, that's her choice. I love fanfics. I've gone on fanfiction.net. I've gone on archive of our own. There are amazing writers out there, and I love how they build upon characters that already exist. The Game of Thrones books are really dark. There are a lot of dark genres out there. The fact that you're having this issue, I have to ask, how long was he reading into the story to get to this scene? Maybe he got interested and it was like, how dare you interest me? Now I'm mad. <laughs> <laughs> now, I think what really pushes it too far is one, he takes something away that's technically not his to do. If she's working and paying for that phone, that's her property. Two, I have to agree with you. What are you doing? You're at home. Plug your phone in and give it a call, even if you're attached to the wall. And then last, how dare you demean and call your daughter disgusting? You think as a parent that that's okay? Because it's not. And if the OP had to undress you for you to see it, tough luck. Those words can be very damaging. Extremely. Especially because kids put a lot of trust and look up to you. Your words carry a lot of weight. And when you say those things, boy. Now, I do find it funny because there were some other Redditors that actually came out with their stories on how parents had found certain romance books, essentially. And once again, I come back to how far do these parents read through these books? All I imagine is that they get to the part where they get to the messenger bags and they're like, oh, oh, titillating, <laughs> but you're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> what was that site again? <laughs> just, just so I know to block it. Well, let's go to our next story and see what you think about this one. Am I the a-hole for telling my mother-in-law she isn't allowed to attend my son's funeral? Me and my husband, 28 female and 30 male, lost our son late last year, a week before Christmas. It was a tough time for us, and we went through what we thought was the end of ours. Our son died, and we thought our world was going to end like any parents would think. For a bit of context, when my son was alive, his grandmother wanted nothing to do with him because we didn't pick the name she wanted it to be. She didn't even send him a birthday card or come visit us when we were in the hospital when he was ill. She contacted me on New Year's Day, asking about the funeral, and I told her she wasn't allowed to attend, and if I saw her on the land where it was taking place, I would have her removed. I told my husband this and he agreed with me, but I feel bad. But at the same time, I don't. She wanted nothing to do with him when he was healthy. She wouldn't visit or give him birthday cards or even a Christmas card. Then, when he fell ill, we did inform her and she hung up on us. Now, she's making me feel like a bad guy for not inviting her to a funeral of a child she wanted nothing to do with because of a simple name. Am I the a-hole? No. Your husband, and you said it in that moment, you and your husband had a conversation and agreed upon it. I understand we're all human and we all have feelings. It sounds like you have a lot of sympathy, but sometimes it can be misplaced. And in this case, it definitely is. Your mother-in-law wanted nothing to do with that child over a silly name. Because I couldn't imagine holding hate in my heart over a name and staying away from a gift. She didn't have any right to invite herself to a funeral that she had no business being a part of. Can you fathom that type of pettiness over a name? Oh, I can't. Do they ever say how old their child was? No. I am really sorry for their loss. I also feel very sorry for the loss. The consensus on Reddit is that our OP is definitely not the a-hole. 
In fact, many of them say to hold her ground. And our OP did confirm that her and her husband are both on the same page and all that they want to do is put their son at rest. Just keep supporting each other. Well, let's go to our next story and see what you think about this little doozy. Am I the butt for giving my son Cole for Christmas? <laughs> you took us from such a serious, sad story and then you gave me Cole? Yes. <laughs> I'm 39 female. Husband is 43 male. And children are 11 male, 10 female, and 7 female. We do the whole Santa thing every year for our kids. And every year, Santa has the same expectations for them. They have to be well-behaved, maintain good grades, and help with keeping the house clean. My children understand this and usually try their best. However, this year, my son, Michael, hasn't really kept up with his grade expectations. He's usually the type to get straight A's and is the joy to have in class student. But this year, he's been doing poorly in math and getting a C average at best. I've tried rewards and incentives for getting good scores on work, helping him with his homework and after-school programs, but nothing seems to work. In the beginning of December, I let him know that he wouldn't get anything from Santa if he didn't get his grades up, and that seemed to get him to get his butt in gear. For a bit, he was starting to excel again, but around the middle of the month, his grades dropped again. I equated this to him thinking he's done enough, so now he doesn't have to try. I tried again to help and still nothing. So I followed through with the rules and on Christmas Eve wrapped him, Cole, from Santa. Then on Christmas Day, when he opens it, he cried about being good and thinking Santa hated him. I told him blankly, maybe Santa gave you that because you didn't get good grades like you were supposed to. He spent the rest of the day sad as his sisters enjoyed their gifts from Santa. My husband pulled me aside later in the day and asked what was wrong with me, and I told him that he knew his expectations and didn't get the grades he was supposed to. We then argued as he thought I should have given him a real present anyway, and that he tried, but I wanted to stick to my guns and make sure my kids no, I won't accept less than what is already expected. My husband's been ignoring me, so now I'm wondering if maybe I was wrong. Am I in the wrong here? Someone actually does deserve some coal, but it's not your child. How old is the boy? Eleven. Man, what a lesson to teach. That's terrible. I laughed when you're like coal, but you know what I mean? Coal is supposed to be a fun thing you give to people who are understanding that that's supposed to be a joke. Correct. This is not a joke. That is not an adult. That's an 11 year old who you told me struggles in school with just math and gets a C, but it's no longer an A. So now it's an issue. But there are reasons it's happening. And the thing is, this type of parenting, oh, it's it's really bad. When you set those expectations at maximum, you're going to burn your kids out well before they hit adulthood. When they're struggling, especially when you make grades um, a transactional yeah, reward system. Yeah, you get good grades, I'll reward you oh, with this. Oh, it's so sad. You're saying to your child that my love needs to be met by this certain degree of grade. And if you don't hit this grade, I don't love you as much. Don't get me wrong. A lot of people have grown up with that in the household. And I think it's wrong. Because a lot of people are told that if a kid does not get a certain grade, that they're just not trying hard enough. It is ridiculous and it's painful to hear it. And the worst part is she's doubling down. Her husband pulled her aside and told her how ridiculous this was. This situation was. And she said, I'm digging in and I'm sticking to what I said. There are reasons why your kid isn't getting the grades that you aspire him to get. She's saying, well, the reason why I'm treating him like this is because I've gone above and beyond to make sure it doesn't happen. And he's still failing in her mind failing. And I guess I can only amount this to maybe this is how she was treated growing up. So this is why it's acceptable to treat my kids like this. So I succeeded. This is the bar that they need to be at through the way I was raised then obviously they'll also reach that if I push them the same way. 
That is not how life works. <laughs> is a terrible way to parent. I'll say it like this. I grew up sometimes not even getting Christmas gifts just because of the financials in the home. I would rather have not gotten a Christmas gift than to have been given coal and then believe that Santa hates me and that this is why this is happening. And then have my mother come in and go, guess you should have tried harder. Dude, I'll stick with being the poor kid and not getting anything for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> that is a far better existence than what she just did to her son. You're callous and I'm scared for your son because unless you go get yourself some help, you're going to keep having these unrealistic expectations of people around you. And to the point where you push them either to do some wild stuff or out of your life completely. OP, in my opinion, you are our wiener jacket of the week. Take a step back and really digest what people have to tell you because you do need the perspective. So first and foremost, the consensus on Reddit is that our OP is definitely the a-hole. Redditors were confounded. Rather than our OP actually parent and try and find out what the true issue is, they jump to the first punishment they can. Let me go ahead and read one comment that I think sums up pretty nicely kind of everything that I was thinking. He's at the age where having a good memory isn't always enough, and he might not actually understand mathematical thinking. This is a red flag that he needs tutoring, and the source of the issue needs to be found. Also, grades are not moral, and the concept of Santa only giving gifts to nearly perfect children is distressing to me. I think it's absolutely disgusting that our OP would treat their child like this. It is so transactionally calloused, and it's, it's worse, in my opinion. For me, Santa Claus, or Santa Claus, or however it is in your culture that you would like to call the jolly old man, who comes around that's supposed to be giving the spirit of Christmas or Christmas cheer throughout a dark time throughout the year, right? Because that's what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to remind you to be a good person when everything becomes a little difficult. Now you have this child who's trying his hardest and is struggling difficultly in school, who's technically, based on our OP standards, failing in one subject. Not all of them, just one he's having a hard time. You're not trying to find the problem, Instead, you're trying to punish him by utilizing a iconic figure that's supposed to be the symbolism for love and cheer throughout a dark time of the year. My mind can't even wrap itself around how you're trying to raise your child because it's definitely not with love and understanding. Nope. It's my love is met only if you hit the requirements. And that is disgusting to me. I don't understand that. I've always struggled, weirdly enough, when it came to English and history. Those were my two worst subjects. Math and science, I have always excelled at. I find it funny that I've always struggled with English and history because I read a lot. The fact that I sit here reading to you, Tim Stradamus, on our channel, I find it to be hilarious in my mind because as a kid I would struggle to read out loud. It took me a lot of practicing to feel comfortable doing that. I can tell you every teacher has their own way of teaching and a lot of them did things that as an adult I don't agree with. The one thing that I can say is I always had my parents support when it came to trying to practice and get better at something and I have to say, my father was very much the person to try and think outside the box when it came to unleashing my potential. Because for him, just because you see and do things one way doesn't mean that that's the only way to do it. And you are a fantastic reader. Thank you. I try. Well, let's go on to our very last story of the day and throw a baby shower, shall we? For our last story. Am I the a-hole for telling my mother-in-law she won't be seeing my baby after throwing a baby shower for herself? What? My husband and I are expecting our first child. We moved to be closer to his family. I'm no contact with mine. 
my mother-in-law has been referring to the baby as her baby this entire time. She will say things like, I can't wait for my baby to be born. My baby is going to be so loved. This rubs me the wrong way for reasons I cannot explain, but my husband tells me to ignore her. My mother-in-law wanted to throw me a baby shower and invite her friends. She said they made an agreement a long time ago that they would celebrate each other's kids' weddings and births. My husband and I eloped and declined a reception for her friends since we don't know them. My mother-in-law told me that I owed it to her to let her throw the baby shower since I hurt her friend's feelings by not having a wedding reception. I asked if I could invite my friends, and she said no, that this was for her friends, and that if my friends wanted to throw me a shower, they could. I reluctantly agreed. My husband and I spent hours on our registry, and my mother-in-law asked for it so she could share with her friends. She said she forwarded the registry on. She asked me what design I wanted on my cake and cookies. I told her flowers because I am decorating the nursery in a garden theme. At the shower, they provided me with a mother-to-be sash and my mother-in-law a granny-to-be sash to wear. I noticed that the theme of the shower was circus animals. The cake had an elephant and balloons on it and the cookies were animals. At first, I thought that maybe the floral theme was just too difficult, so I rolled with it until it was time to open presents. Every present was some sort of circus animal, onesies, blankets, toys, nothing on my registry. I was a little confused and even went so far to check my registry to make sure I hadn't goofed up and changed everything. I thanked everyone for their gifts and tried to sound as gracious as possible, but I was so confused. My husband, who is a little less tactful than I am, showed up at the end of the shower and noticed the theme right away. He goes, what's up with all the circus animals? He looks at the presents and says, this isn't what we asked for. Then he looked at his mom and goes, mom, what did you do? She smiled and said, I didn't like the theme you chose for my baby. I'm going to decorate my baby's nursery at my house with circus animals, so I created a registry for myself. My husband said, You did what? She says, My baby is going to need a room at my house, so I threw a shower for myself. I lost my composure and told her that she would not see my baby and to stop calling the baby hers, and my husband told his mom that she's delusional if she thinks we're going to allow this. She started crying and said we are just withholding her baby from her. We've been getting texts from his family since the shower, calling us selfish and ungrateful and saying we ruined her joy of being a grandma. Are we the a-hole? This is the spasimitable. Although there's been a lot of them in this one. This is a really bad episode. <laughs> <laughs> this one takes the cake. <laughs> <laughs> the circus cake? Gosh. You know... ROP is very tolerant because she says it throughout the period of this story. She's like constantly fact checking her own stuff. She's like, I had to make sure the registry didn't say something different. You know, maybe floral is hard to get. She's constantly giving her mother-in-law the benefit of the doubt until, and thank goodness for her husband. That's a keeper. <laughs> Came up into there and said, What's going on? <laughs> we said floral. What's all this stuff? Did this happen with all of the mother-in-law's friends around? Yes, it did. Oh, man. This tastes so good. I love this cake. <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting headspace to be in as the mother-in-law to believe that a baby is yours and that you threw yourself a baby shower to take all of the things that are meant for a baby shower for yourself and not for the actual parents. I would be a little bit put on edge just because that sounds like a lot of mental illness. And as much fun as it is to laugh at this story and how outlandish it is, it does need to be taken with some seriousness because we hear these type of stories all the time. I would go little to no contact for a little while, um, at least until our child was a little older and... We felt safe. So, OP, you're definitely not the a-hole. 
So, the consensus on Reddit is our OP is definitely not the a-hole. In fact, there were some commenters that were saying, Oh man, you have one of those mother-in-laws. I'm so sorry. Other people dealing with this too, huh? Yeah. You had other Redditors that essentially were saying, Whew, this is the start of something crazy. One of them even said, I think I probably watch or listen to too much true crime, but referring to someone else's kid as my or our baby freaks me the heck out. Well, I do have some updates. Oh? So why don't we go ahead and start with the first one? Our OP says in the comment section, thank you all for your feedback. Just a little more info now that I'm awake and can communicate better. I have text messages where mother-in-law and I conversed about the shower, what I wanted, me sending her my registry, etc. She was all, this is going to be so wonderful. You're going to love it. My friends are so excited for you. I can't wait to see what everyone gets you. Call me naive, but I did not think that she had ill intent with this. For those asking why I reluctantly agreed to attend a party with her friends, I could tell how much it meant to her to carry on this tradition with her friends, but I was hesitant because I had never met them. My husband and I had declined the wedding reception she wanted to throw for the same reason. I didn't know them, and he hadn't seen them in over 20 years. We had eloped, so we had no intention of throwing a reception of any kind. We didn't even have a bridal shower, other than one that my co-workers threw as a surprise. But I could see how much it meant to her to host this shower. And there's a part of me that wishes I had this kind of tradition in my life. I also felt guilty when she said her friend's feelings were hurt that they couldn't celebrate our marriage. I spoke with my husband last night before we went to bed and told him that I feel like we need to say something to the extended family sooner rather than later. I said I understand he wants to respond logically and not emotionally, but that I also feel like us not saying anything looks like we have something to hide. He agreed and said that he will send a well-worded response later today. He just wants to think of how to word it before sending anything. I can respect that. He wants to make the situation better, not worse. As I said in my original post, he's a little tactless and he knows it. He wants to make sure he keeps what he says neutral and to the point. He's also not sure what to say to his mom at this point. He said once he sees how the family reacts to the whole story, then he'll be able to make a better judgment of how to approach her. There had been zero discussion with her about setting up a room at her house for the baby. I asked my husband last night had she mentioned anything to him about it, and he said no, other than she suggested we add a pack and play to our registry so we can have a portable crib. He said he was as shocked as I was to find out that she had intended on setting up a full-fledged nursery at her house and that he had no idea she was throwing a shower for herself. I asked him why he didn't take me seriously when I said that her calling the baby her baby made me uncomfortable, and he said that he thought it was just a generational thing. I asked him why he didn't ask her to stop, and he said he wishes he had and feels bad for not taking me more seriously. He said he knows I have trauma from the years of abuse at my mother's hand and thought maybe I was reacting due to that, but now he sees that it goes beyond that. He also knows that, due to my past experiences, I tend to blame myself for things and don't stand up for myself even though I should. I grew up believing everything that went wrong was my fault. Years of therapy have helped, but I still find myself with that mindset in some situations. I'm a bit of a people pleaser, trying to keep the peace, so he wishes he had stood up sooner rather than disregarding what made me uncomfortable. He repeated that his mom is notorious for making things about herself, but that he had no clue she would go to this extent. We agreed that if she had just been honest with her intent, then we would have been okay with it. Maybe a little weirded out, if we're being honest here, but we would have allowed it. What bothers both of us the most is the extent she went to deceive us rather than just having a conversation with us. 
We had no clue grandparent showers were a thing either. We're not certain we want to go 100% no contact with mother-in-law at this time, but we want to keep our distance from her for now. We did agree that she will not be allowed to be alone with the baby for the foreseeable future. The hospital that I'm giving birth in allows infants to stay in the room with the mother, so my husband and I have agreed that she, the baby, will stay with us as much as possible. We're still up in the air as to whether we're going to allow visitors at the hospital. Some of that will be determined how I feel after the birth, if I end up needing a C-section, etc. Mother-in-law definitely will not be allowed in the room while I'm delivering. No one but the husband and our medical staff. The big thing we agreed on is that we want our baby to be loved and safe and secure. He knows that I don't have a family to fall back on other than my brother, who has said that he will buy a plane ticket and be out here as soon as possible if I need him, and my friends, who have been very supportive and are excited to become aunties. We want our baby to have a sense of family that I did not have growing up. My husband's dad and stepmom have been absolutely amazing from the second we announced our pregnancy to them, and I have no doubt the two of them will be loving, doting grandparents. Honestly, I suspect mother-in-law will be a good grandma, but she's going to have to earn mine and my husband's trust again. Yup. Trust is something once broken needs to be earned. Now let me go on to the last update from our... OP in the comment section. Our OP says, my update post was denied slash deleted, so I'm sharing an update here. Most of you were correct. My husband talked to his brother yesterday. Mother-in-law is plotting to take my child, but it's because she thinks I'm going to be like my own mother. My own mother was physically and emotionally abusive to me and my brother. Mother-in-law told basically everyone that I'm mentally unstable, so she's preparing a room for when, not if, my husband leaves with the baby. The baby shower was a ruse to try to get a rise out of me and show her friends how unstable I am, but my husband ruined it by showing up and being the one to really say something. I mouthed off a bit, but my mother-in-law was hoping to really push me over the edge. I assume the my baby comments were testing the waters as well. I've been in therapy for years, and I've been working on my own fears of being like my mom with my therapist. We have a weekly standing appointment on Zoom. I've also talked with my OB and a psychiatrist about staying on my medication and watching closely for signs of postpartum depression. My husband has been a part of all these conversations and has sat in therapy with me multiple times. I'm not violent or known to have violent outbursts. I tend to withdraw and be non-confrontational when I'm upset. I can't say I fault mother-in-law for having concerns, but I wish she'd gone about showing it in a completely different manner, such as talking with me and my husband. He has half a mind to go to her house and just rip her a new one, but I told him no. We're not going to fight fire with fire. If she talked with me about her concerns, I feel we wouldn't have reached this point. I've been able to share what I went through with her. We've always been able to talk about such things. She's seen my arms and legs, which are scarred from physical abuse. She's odd, but never uncivil towards me. I would have told her I shared those concerns and then told her what steps I'm taking to prevent them. I haven't told her about having those worries because, ironically enough, I didn't want to worry her. I don't want to keep my daughter from a grandparent who loves her. I just wish things had been handled a little differently. I think that's incredibly destructive to believe that you're son who's married and has a child is going to have a completely failed marriage and family and you have to throw a baby shower to get prepared for it i've never heard of a grandparent throwing a baby shower for herself yeah that's a new one maybe that might be the norm now i have never seen that as the norm usually the baby showers are for the parents now i will say i commend our op for being worried about being 
as vile as her biological mother appears to be. But you are not your parents. And I would just like to say this for anyone out there. You are not your parents. You are your own person. You decide what you want to be as a person. I think it's commendable. If our OP is thinking about that, that means she's striving to make sure that she makes the best choices for her child. And honestly, that should be the only thing that she focuses on. Don't focus on that negative stuff. Just focus on the best things that you want to be for your kid. And everything else will work itself out. Your mother-in-law sounds horrendous. And in fact, in the comments section of this OP, her husband comes on multiple times and says he will never forgive his mother for what she's done. And there is no way that she's going to be seeing their kid because all of this is just too much to try and use family to twist and manipulate so that people can see the worst in her daughter-in-law. That's gross. How can anybody who's associated with her be okay with that? I find it funny because our OP says that she thinks her mother-in-law kept all those gifts, even though the guests know that apparently it wasn't anything that the OP wanted. Some of the aunts apparently are saying, you know, reconcile. And there's a brother that's in the mix who is saying that he just wants to stay out of it. And you guys need to just head it off between each other. Love how when other people have no skin in the game, when it doesn't affect them or their baby, have something to tell you. Oh, yes. Love that. Now, there were a lot of commenters that were saying, you know, you don't need to be living anywhere near whatever that mother-in-law is doing. Our OP was very like clear that they had just signed a lease to the house and they might be stuck there at least until the lease is done because both of them actually do remote work. So hopefully they're able to pick up and move somewhere else. Another form of advice was maybe you should potentially get a lawyer in the mix just in case she does try to do anything. The last thing that you would want is for her to go ahead and strike out and make it seem as if you both are unfit parents when it's just her hidden agenda to try and take your child away. Hopefully none of those things come to pass um, and it's just good advice just to be aware. Agreed. Take care of your family. So was that our last story? That was our last story. I can't say I've ever heard of something like that. But I'm also not surprised. I'm just saying, I've heard plenty of stories where people, and and I don't just mean like strangers. Some of them have been strangers. I've heard of babysitters and I've heard of grandparents taking away children from the natural parents. Those stories are very scary. I guess my only question is, on the way out of the shower, did they take the cake? That's all I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> You and cake, Tamsterdamas. Yes. I'd been like, Mom, this is all wrong, but I'm going to take the cake off your hands. <laughs> We're out of here. <laughs> I don't think that's quite how it happened, but I like that. Well, as our stories come to a close, don't forget, you see in the world what you carry in your heart. If you have enjoyed listening to us read and talk about today's stories, please rate, subscribe, and turn on notifications for more content. We regularly post on Mondays. Only Mondays. We would also love to go ahead and thank all of our patrons for your continued support. Yes, we love and appreciate all our little tea bags. <laughs> <laughs> they are chai chroniclers and novice steepers. Sir. Sorry, sorry. And yes, we would love to hear your viewpoints and your opinions in the comments section below. Which of these stories really baffled you today? And remember, if you post it, maybe I'm going to get some of that cake. Only after we wash the dogs. Yeah, we have to give them a bath this week, huh? Yeah, we do. Here comes the chores, but I'll give you a cake after. Ruff.